words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was in France last month, I had three conversations with three different French people that had stayed with me because they were so similar to each other and they were so different from similar conversations that I would have I've had over the years with people in the United States. It came up twice in cafes and once on a train, uh, what I do for a living. And I explained that I'm a priest. And once we clarified that I'm not a Roman Catholic priest, but an Anglican priest in the Episcopal Church, they looked at me and all three of them said some variation of, oh, oh. Now, when I have that conversation in the United States, it goes a, a, a number of different ways, but never like that. The conversation, if it's with someone who's a bit younger than I am, it's often, well, I, I, I went, used to go to church as a kid, but I kind of stopped going when I was a teenager, haven't ever really gotten back into it, and, uh, you know, I feel a little bad about that. I believe in God, and, you know, and I'm a faithful, spiritual person, I just, I'm, just not, I'm just not into church, I'm not into organized religion. Or if they're my age and a little older, the story is often, I went to church, but I, I, I felt wounded, I felt attacked by the church. I wasn't allowed to receive communion because I got divorced. Or I didn't feel welcome in the church because I'm gay. So they, they would assure me that they believe in God, they're a spiritual person, but they just don't worship in the institutional church. If they're a very young person in their teens or 20s, maybe they've had no experience of the church at all. Their parents never took them. On the occasion that they have gone, it just all seemed very weird and foreign, didn't connect with them, and they've never really tried it. They're, they are spiritual, but not religious. A couple years ago, I taught a class called Spiritual But Not Religious at Hobart William Smith. It filled up the day registration open. 30 students on the first day of class, 29 of them said that they believe in God, but they don't go to church for a whole host of different reasons. The one student who said he didn't believe in God by the end of the semester said, well, maybe he did believe in God. He was thinking about it again. We engaged throughout the semester in a whole host of different spiritual practices that the students wrote about and reflected on and really engaged in in a faithful way. No interest on any of them in checking out church on a Sunday morning or Saturday evening or Sunday night, but people working out their faith just not within the confines of the institutional church. So these conversations in France where the difference was not on their relationship with the church, it was just not believing in God, not believing in a supernatural, what they would say, supernatural being who intercedes in human affairs, just makes no sense to them. This idea of life after death wasn't of any interest to them. It's really shocking in a country where you can't throw a, a rock without hitting a beautiful church, but they're empty on Sunday mornings. A real difference between French culture and culture here in the United States. I think it's partly how the two cultures deal with doubt, deal with questions. Because in the French mind, they don't understand how they've never seen a miracle, they don't understand, they don't believe in God as a being who they can't see, who they've never experienced, kind of entering into human affairs in a, in a, in a a, a, a weird way that they, they've never witnessed themselves, that doubt leads them to not believing in God. Where in this country it leads to conversation, which I really think is great. Another conversation I've had over the years with people who are kind of on the fence about whether they do or don't believe in God, I, ask, I would ask them to tell me about the God that they don't believe in. And when I hear about the God that they don't believe in, I often am able to say, look, I, I don't believe in that God either. I don't believe in a God of judgment. I don't believe in a God who draws clear lines around groups of people. I don't believe in a God who says there are people on the inside and people on the outside. I believe in a God of love who draws people into the center, who draws those on the margins to the table. And we can have a good conversation. I think this story that we just heard, the Sadducees trying to trip Jesus up, revolves around the Sadducees' doubt about who Jesus is, who God is, and, and, and particularly around the question of resurrection. 
What you have to understand to understand what's going on here is that the Sadducees were a sect within Judaism in Jesus' day who had trouble with the doctrine of resurrection of the day. And Jews believed in resurrection in Jesus' day, but it works differently than what we talk about today. Jews believed that at the last day, when God returns in glory, when the trumpet sounds, at the end of time, that people of faith would be raised from the dead in their physical bodies. And that created all sorts of problems, like am I going to be a skeleton, or am I going to be raised to a physical body in hell? So there were all those questions kind of swirling around, but the Sadducees just thought none of that made any sense whatsoever. So they come up with this, this uh, extreme story in order to kind of trip Jesus up, to point out what they think is just the ridiculousness of this idea of physical resurrection. He said, there's a woman who marries a man, and the man dies. And, it, and according to Jewish tradition at that time, if, if a woman is widowed, it falls to the man's brothers, the rest of the man's family, to take care of her. And so, according to tradition, the man's next oldest brother marries her, takes her into his household. He also dies. There's another brother. He dies. Another brother. He dies. And so on and so on through seven brothers. The widow, the, the woman herself, finally dies. And the question that the Sadducees asked Jesus in order to point out how ridiculous this idea of physical resurrection is, at the last day, when these eight people are raised from the dead, whose wife will the woman be? Was to be the wife of the first man? The seventh man? All seven of them? Does this make any sense, they're trying to say to Jesus? And Jesus responds in a very pastoral, gentle way. He says, look, <coughs> resurrection doesn't work like that. Resurrection, new life, doesn't look like this one. It's beyond your imagination. It's beyond your experience. Your experience is in a physical form, a physical body. Eternal life is a different kind of thing. It doesn't rely on a physical body. And I don't know if the Sadducees understood what Jesus was saying. I don't know if it changed their mind. I'm grateful that they had the, the willingness to bring their question to Jesus and to explore that. I'm grateful that Jesus didn't just write them off and walk, walk away from them, that he, he stopped and had that conversation. What, what, I, what I take from this story is the importance of bringing our doubts to our life of faith. Anne Lamott writes that the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. The opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. The problem with certainty is that it closes the door. It builds walls. It closes the possibility that things may be beyond your ability to understand. Maybe there's reality out there that's beyond our experience. There are things that God can do that are beyond our imagination. But the God who created all things out of nothing, who raised the dead to new life, the God who brings healing and wholeness, who draws people together, is capable of doing things that are outside of our experience, outside of our ability to understand, even outside of our ability to imagine that they're possible. Certainty closes the door to that, shuts down that possibility. Faith, a living faith, welcomes the possibility that there are experiences in this life, there are aspects of reality that are beyond our understanding that are beyond our experience, that are even beyond our ability to imagine <clears throat> that they're possible. Jesus invites the Sadducees, he invites you and I into a living faith where we bring our questions, where we bring our doubts, where we, where we explore the possibility that we don't know everything. It's one of the things I love about the Episcopal Church Way back when we were being founded in England in the 16th century, Queen Elizabeth said that she did not seek to create a window into people's hearts. She didn't really care, at the end of the day, what people believed. She didn't have a list of, of things that you had to sign when you entered the church saying, I believe X, Y, and Z about God, about humanity, about this, that, or the other thing. 
What was important to Queen Elizabeth, what was important at the founding of our church, was that we gathered together to worship. Our, our worship is governed by the Book of Common Prayer, prayers that we say together. It was important to her that we gather together for worship, not so much that we all believe the same thing. She had practical reasons for doing that, because England was what otherwise would have been split apart with theological debates, because it had uh, Roman Catholic history, there was all this stuff going on in the Reformation. She had a political kind of thought about doing that, but there was a theological wisdom to it as well. I'm sure, I know from conversations here with with, uh, with you over the year and a half I've been here, that we don't all believe the same things about God, and I welcome that diversity. I hope that you will continue to bring your questions, bring your doubts with you to church, that you will explore them, that you will ask God for guidance and help, that you'll recognize that there are things about this life that we don't understand, that are beyond our experience, that are beyond our ability to understand, beyond even our ability to imagine. I hope that by doing that, that you will find that your faith is deepened, that you are living a living faith that draws you closer to God, draws you closer to one another, and draws you closer to your own best self. Amen. Amen.